we're going to be talking about as clinicians working with the LBGTQ plus community, youth and their families, what we should be aware of, what competencies are involved, what resources are available. And to discuss this, I'm really glad to have with us Chris McLaughlin. He is a licensed clinical social worker. He's also the executive director of the main chapter of the National Association for Social Workers and the owner of Inspired Consulting Group, LLC. So Chris, thanks so much for joining me. Hi, Ray. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And to get us started, uh, maybe you could just share a little bit about yourself. Like what got you into the field of social work and and then specifically working in the niche of working with the LBGTQ plus community? Sure. Well, first of all, it's so great to be with you today. I'm excited to uh, just talk about this really, really uh, important topic. So my story is probably not unlike a lot of folks. I um, floundered a bit in undergrad, kind of wondering what I wanted to do, and always had that image of Jodie Foster from Silence of the Lambs kind of floating around, like, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and then I realized uh, later in my undergraduate that that it was not what I wanted to do. I had the good fortune of working as a direct care um, frontline staff member at a psychiatric hospital working on the pediatric unit. And it was through my time there that I actually was exposed to social work uh, for the first time and was very fortunate to have uh, the ability to work side by side with really amazing inpatient psychiatric clinicians and a psychiatrist who just blew me away with their um, professionalism, their expertise, but also their compassion and empathy. Um, and so through them, I learned more about the field of social work and quickly decided that that was a much better career path than interviewing serial killers in prison. So I, yes. uh, I went that route in grad school um, and have never looked back. I am in my 21st year now of post uh, MSW education and really am just, uh, I, I just feel so honored to be able to do what I do every single day. Uh, specifically with this population, Ray, as a member myself of the LGBTQ plus community, I've always felt like it was um, a calling of mine to give back to this population. And just thinking about some of the struggles that I myself remember having as a youth and, and how much I wished that I had access to out uh, social workers, educators, guidance counselors, just out folks who uh, could kind of light that path for me. So I started specializing with LGBTQ plus youth early in my career, and then broadened that work to working with families as well as um, the community as a whole of all ages. Uh, and again, have never looked back. It's been the highlight of my career, being able to um, partner clinically with this with this group of kids and families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, having role models where we can kind of see ourselves in that position, appreciate it, really helps us formulate our career. And um, yeah, and in terms of uh, working with clients, uh, clinicians working with clients very often would have no idea uh, in terms of sexual orientation or gender identity um, of their clients, right? Unless, unless they ask and so forth. And, and if they're not culturally competent, there could be harm done or, you know, the rapport might not ever be established and so forth. So yeah. can you speak to that in terms of, uh, you know, every clinician ought to have some awareness and competency in this area and what that looks like? Yeah, uh, great question. Early on in my career, I was in a school um, district as doing some traditional social work as well as uh, some clinical assessments for students who had come into some kind of trouble. Maybe they had got caught with tobacco products on campus or they had um, been truant or skipping school, something that had brought them to the attention of school staff. And part of my role in that job was to do 
a really bare bones assessment, work with the student in a very short term, almost solution focused kind of way and put the bandaid on them and move them on their way. Um, and that was also around the same time of my career that I started including questions about sexual orientation, gender identity pronouns in my assessments 100% of the time. Um, prior to that, I would only bring it up to your point when the client or the family member said, geez, this is something I think my kid needs to talk about. So I made this shift to regardless of the presenting concern, asking these questions 100% of the time. And I will never forget one of the first kiddos that came into my office. I was doing my questions and kind of going through my assessment and I hit that sexual orientation section and this kid froze. And he, to the point where I was busy taking notes and looked up and thought, you know what, you know, what happened? And he had tears in his eyes and said, you are the first adult who's ever asked me about my sexual orientation. And at that point he came out as gay and the rest of the assessment followed that sort of pathway of his struggles with sexuality, his struggles with being closeted, his struggles with fitting in socially and how that played out with some of his experimentation with substances and trying to get in with the cool kids. And um, our, the engagement that I had, even on a short-term basis with this kiddo, um, was unlike anything I had experienced in that role prior, uh, to the point where years later, he was coming back to my office to check in and say hi and an update on the A he just got in this, in this class, or the driver's ed course he just aced, or the job interview he was planning on having. And so I learned um, in a very in my face kind of way, the importance of normalizing those questions and the importance of making sure clients knew that any answer to those questions was okay, that this was a safe place for them to respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would imagine uh, there's a fair amount of kids that are, are in the discovery phase, right? Trying to figure out, it's like unknown. Uh, yeah, that's oftentimes the cue in LGBTQ. It's that questioning. Sometimes mm -hmm. that cue can stand for queer. Uh, mm -hmm. And other times that cue is solidly for questioning. And those, and mm -hmm. those kiddos, uh, and oftentimes adults who are, for whatever reason, at a place where they're able to finally start wrestling with that part of themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know I've worked with an adult that went through that process. Yeah, and you also work with families and parents. Uh, so, you know, how do you determine, you know, when to say bring in parents or guardians uh, in, into the work that you're doing with a, with a kid? Yeah, it's definitely a delicate dance at times, especially knowing that many youth are not out and are not ready to be out to their families, or perhaps they've attempted to come out and the results were less than, um, less than positive. And so they've made that decision to keep that part of themselves um, hidden from parents and caregivers. So there are times where the youth that I'm working with says it's time. Let's bring mom, dad, grandma, let's bring them in and let's have this, let's do this. Um, and then there are times where the youth might be outed in other ways and the family learns about it and my phone blows up, like what is going on? And so um, one of my rules of thumb is to all, always follow the lead of the youth that it is not ever my role, regardless of where I'm practicing, to uh, out that kid to their parent, even if there are safety issues present, which as many folks know, the behavioral health um, outcomes for this population is uh, pretty scary at times. Even if those safety issues are present, it would not be ever appropriate for me to out that youth to their caregivers without their consent. Yeah, 
And what's, what's been the evolution as a, as a, uh, you know, a field, a, um, a field of healthcare in terms of supporting LBGTQ plus folks. Yeah, we're moving in the right direction. I will absolutely give um, clinicians and care uh, healthcare providers credit. Moving in the right direction. I feel like Ray, in a lot of ways, um, healthcare folks have gotten really comfortable with the LGB part of that um, acronym, they feel more comfortable with sexual orientation, especially where that process seems to happen later in a client's life, adolescence, puberty, or beyond. It's the gender piece that I think collectively providers continue to struggle with. Um, it's something that is um, often difficult to understand. It's difficult to articulate uh, with parents. Um, it's a very politicized issue, uh, especially in today's uh, the, in the world today's world that we live in. Um, and so I feel like in a lot of ways, that's the new frontier is getting clinicians to get more comfortable with the um, gender identity piece of that of that acronym. Yeah, so it sounds like a, a big piece of what clinicians ought to do is almost like a uh, um, growth or transformation in of them in, in themselves in terms of their bias, mm -hmm. uh, being comfortable, uh, being used to using term different terminology. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head. I mean, this um, this is one of those issues perhaps like working with incarcerated populations or folks with uh, substance use disorders, uh, working with LGBTQ plus clients takes a lot of introspection and a lot of getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and mm -hmm. having conversations, asking questions and be willing to explore things that as clinicians we might have felt was a little taboo in the past, uh, especially when working with youth. Um, and so that takes some work. It takes some exploration of bias. It takes some uh, education. And again, practice, getting you saying these terms and talking about um, adolescent sexuality and gender. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you've chosen to get in some, into some leadership positions within your field of social work. Uh, in terms of, you know, professional associations, have you seen an evolution in terms of how they support the LBGTQ plus community and what still needs to happen there, if anything? Yeah, without a doubt. I'm um, so proud to be a member and a leader within the National Association of Social Workers, mm -hmm. um, leading the chapter here in Maine and and being part of the national leadership team, um, they do an amazing job with education and advocacy. Uh, my social work colleagues out there will know that this is now baked within our code of ethics. And we as social workers are um, called upon to advocate on behalf of marginalized populations, including uh, sexual and gender minority individuals, youth and otherwise. Um, so I see a lot of progress there. I see a lot of movement in the right directions, and I see a lot of opportunity for continued growth. Um, what we know about working with LGBTQ plus populations is that it's not a one and done conversation. This field, like so much of the other fields we work in, is constantly evolving and constantly changing. The way I worked with LGBTQ plus youth 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, looks so different than now. And some of that, I think, is culturally defined. Some of it is legislatively defined. Um, and really, um, the context by which I'm working with these youth. So a lot of strides forward and a lot of opportunity and, and um, a calling for continued evolution forward. Yeah, and are there any assessments of bias that clinicians can take to, to help discover their bias? 
Yeah, good question. Um, probably the one that comes most immediately to mind that also is very well known is the Harvard implicit bias tests that are free mm -hmm. and available online. Um, and they, uh, the Harvard team has these implicit bias uh, tests on really any number of minority groups or, um, or different categories of people, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, transgender mm -hmm. folks in particular are a part of their catalog. So I often refer people to start there. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it just takes some good introspection. It really, for me, is sometimes as easy as watching what Hollywood serves us when they are depicting a queer youth or an LGBTQ plus adult. And for us to hit pause and go, geez, does that match my understanding of this community? Do the LGBTQ plus individuals that I know and love and care about, are they reflected in this character that I'm watching on TV? And if the answer is no, then we've got to actively push back against those stereotypes and find a way for Hollywood to serve us some better representation. Yeah, and in terms of the preparation of clinicians, it seems like the supervision piece would be really important because someone can take courses on, you know, cultural competence, uh, but the implication, the uh, implementation of that can be very different. Um, so, yeah, so I guess supervisors need to be competent in this area and know how to kind of form develop uh, supervisees. Any thoughts sure. on that? Yeah, for sure. It's as much about staying informed and having those competencies in place and being willing to continue to explore those competencies as the field evolves, but also to, ex to really explore our um, transference and um, things about our clients that trouble us. Um, in my work with families, I, it's not uncommon for me to be working with a family who at that moment in time is less than accepting. Um, uh, using uh, their child's dead name, that name that that child no longer identifies with, misgendering the child, um, and um, saying some things out of love and concern and fear uh, and guilt and shame that we wish they wouldn't say. And so our ability to work really in a strength-based collaborative way with families who are less than accepting of their youths, their child's gender identity or sexual orientation can really trigger us. And so supervision is essential in exploring that dynamic and what is it about this individual, this parent, this caregiver that's pushing all my buttons right now, and how might that impact the clinical engagement or the services I'm delivering to their child? Yeah. And in terms of competencies that clinicians ought to be aware of, can you kind of describe the difference between being competent in this area and being able to develop rapport with a client versus not? Maybe some examples of, of what that would look like what the difference would be. Yeah, you know, I, I think about some of the, just the basic terms and concepts that go into working with LGBTQ plus individuals of all ages, our ability to not only just define those terms, um, but really understand how they play in and out of our clients' everyday lives. And so it's one thing for me to know, for instance, what transgender means and I might have some thoughts and ideas about what that client needs to do now that they've identified as trans. And so the difference for me is understanding the concept and then providing a um, client-driven, client-focused, strength-based intervention that is not me driving the bus but my client driving the bus. And that's really one of, I think, the core competencies of this population is there are an indefinite number of ways for trans people to live their life. There are indefinite numbers of ways for trans people to transition or not across all areas of their life. And so that 
um, allowing that client to be an individual and to have the ultimate vote in how their life is being led can be tough for clinicians who feel like they've got some competence in this area and they really want to push that client forward. You'll be so much happier if X, Y, or Z. And so we've got to, we've got to make sure that we're not letting our competencies drive our ego into prescribing treatment for our clients. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, sometimes I find it helpful to watch like TED Talks or YouTube videos of, of people um, in, you know, cultures and, you know, they just have differences from me so that I can understand. So let's say they're struggling with a particular phobia. I've never had that phobia. I don't know what it's like to have that phobia. So what is it like to have that phobia, right? To live with that. So, you know, watching a video of someone that, you know, really explains what it's like day to day for them to live with that phobia can give me some really good awareness. But then I don't want to, you know, have that cookie cutter and, and force a client into that, into that shape because, you know, people experience the same phobia differently and respond to it differently. So openness to people live with things and experience things and so forth differently, but also having some sort of awareness to be able to step into someone's shoes. And of course, like you're saying, the client is the one that informs us in terms of who they are, what they're like, what their life is like, what their challenges and successes are like, like they're the, they're the ultimate instructor. But, um, but sometimes I find it helpful to like, you know, get a sense if, if I feel, if I feel like I'm missing it in terms of what, it, what it's like to be them in their life. Yeah. Uh, and what, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that um, that idea of lived experience and that first person perspective can be so enlightening for us. So much of our work, regardless of the needs of our client, is about empathy and it's our ability to walk with our clients and sit in pain with our clients. And so for us, any way that we can get a better idea of what that person is experiencing and hearing it from them is great. And learning about how other people have experienced the same or similar thing, I think to your point can be really helpful and really enlighten our ability to, um, to join hand in hand with our clients. I, Ted is a great resource. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd encourage folks to get on the Ted page and get into their search feature and just type in gender, type in sexual orientation. And there are countless um, folks who are sharing their lived experience and their lessons, um, both from a from an individual member of this community, as well as a parent and caregiver. There are some wonderful um, TED presenters who come from the caregiver uh, perspective as well. And I think that is also a super helpful uh, perspective to take. Yeah. Um, and can you name some basic competency categories that maybe clinicians should have? Uh, sure. Yeah. First of all, the uh, piece that I've already mentioned around terms, definitions, just understanding the language that's associated with LGBTQ plus individuals. We have some core concepts, the, the concept of coming out and coming out as a process. That's a super helpful competency for clinicians to, to get their heads around. Um, the idea of living in spectrums, getting out of this binary world of it's left or it's right, it's gay or it's straight, and this idea that there's an infinite number of tick marks on that continuum that we all can identify in these different um, domains. I think that's a helpful competency. Understanding social determinants of health, SDOH, is a very useful competency, not just for this population, but all of our clients, but understanding how individuals experience healthcare 
and experience outcomes differently based on these parts of themselves, who they are, how they identify. That's a wonderful competency for us to better understand as well. I also think a competency around um, working with clients who, for many of them, have avoided care for a long time because of fear of discrimination or harassment or, or injustice in their healthcare settings. That's an important competency here is working with, with, working with a client who may have gone undiagnosed, both from a, from a physical health perspective, as well as a behavioral health perspective. There's a lot of catching up to do and helping clients sort of organize that is, is a useful competency. And then finally, this piece around representation, how clinicians can make their space, whether it's on a Zoom screen or in person, more um, inclusive and more uh, accepting of their LGBTQ plus clients and how to do that in a visual way, how to do that in an intake, in a paperwork assessment kind of way, and then how to do that ongoing. Yeah, that's great. And we will be having available uh, courses uh, on this provided by Chris Mc McLaughlin. Um, so if you watching or want to get trained to get competent in this, uh, we will have a certificate program available for you soon. So you can certainly check that out. And then your consultation services, Chris, uh, can you share a little bit about that? Uh, people need additional support for their organization, et cetera. Sure. I, um, I love being uh, invited to come into organizations and work with leaders, work with frontline staff of every level of, of the organization, every discipline on how to beef up those competencies that we just talked about. And again, more than just a one and done, this work is so much bigger than putting a rainbow sticker on your door or having your pronoun pin around your neck. It's so much larger than that. Um, and so it's really, again, I'm so honored to be invited into organizations and help them, coach them every step of the way, um, providing clinical supervision for practitioners working with this population. Again, helping um, look at assessment forms and intake forms and strategies to make their paperwork, their electronic medical records more inclusive is a big part of the consultation work that I do. Um, ongoing education, helping folks navigate the ever-changing field of pronouns and uh, terms and definitions. Um, a lot of uh, this work grows and we are seeing more and more youth across the country start to um, redefine their understanding of pronouns and their understanding of, of um, their own identity. And so that takes some additional support and consultation as well. And, and anywhere in between, I just, I love spending time educating organizations and supporting clinicians in doing this work better. I, I think it's important, Ray, I want to share with you that over the course of the pandemic, um, an organization that uh, folks may have heard of called the Trevor Project there, um, one of the um, best known and, and rightly so organizations committed to the safety of LGBTQ plus youth. Um, they did some studies and uh, recently uh, released the results of this of this survey of thousands and thousands of of queer youth across the country, and what they found is um, startling. Forty five percent of LGBTQ plus youth said that they had seriously considered suicide over the course of the pandemic. With uh, fourteen percent of these youth acknowledging at least one actual suicide attempt. For trans youth in particular, that number is closer to one in five youth wow. attempting suicide over the pandemic. And um, tying into this, upwards of 25% of LGBTQ plus youth said that they needed behavioral health care over the pandemic and could not find it. Couldn't oh, wow. It. And so for me, this is a real calling 
for all of us to do better, to really work towards making our own practice more inclusive, more affirming, and more safe so that these kids can get the service that they are so desperate for right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it, Chris. Thanks for having me on, Ray. It's great talking with you.